Welcome back to another episode of the We Love to Build podcast. I'm here today with Michael Alexis, the CEO and owner of teambuilding.com. We are very similar in that we are nomads and entrepreneurs, and that's one of the reasons why I brought him on today. Uh, maybe we will also talk about minimalism. Um, I think we're also very similar in that regard. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Michael. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit about what teambuilding.com is, and we'll go from there. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, TeamMobile.com. Nobody has ever been surprised that we run team building events for corporate groups. For uh, all of the pandemic, that meant virtual events over Zoom. Uh, we do them in person as well. So examples would be uh, online. We have tiny campfire. We send people s'mores kits uh, in the mail in advance that bring everybody out a Zoom call for camp games, ghost stories, uh, etc. In-person event might be uh, the great walk-off. We do guacamole making competitions at people's offices, outdoor scavenger hunts, uh, museum tours, et cetera, et cetera. The goal, ha let employees have a good time together, fun, connection, happiness, uh, et cetera. Cool. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I just have to ask, have you ever done a virtual reality-based team building exercise for a client? Not VR based uh, externally, we've done and tested some stuff internally, so possibly in the future. Do you mind talking a little bit more about what you've tested? I'm curious. Yeah, so uh, I've got a favorite game of all time, which is on Oculus called Population One shooting game. It's a little bit, uh, it gets compared to Fortnite for uh, VR. Uh, that is one that I play outside of work and I've noticed that there's very, very strong kind of squad and team dynamics in it. So we recognize that as like, hey, there's something here to capture, right? Like beyond being on a Zoom call and us talking, if we're in VR, it's like we're doing something together. We're talking over the headset in a way that feels very organic and in person. Uh, that is like more advanced than what we would do for a team build event and frankly, probably too violent. But as we explore the options, it's like, oh, what could we do as an escape room or problem solving or games that are uh, a little bit more familiar to team building and collaboration and working together? So originally I wanted to talk about just minimalism and travel and being a digital nomad. I also kind of want to spend some time talking more about team building because that's also a very important thing for company owners to be thinking about. Um, especially for someone like myself, I also run a remote company. We've got uh, 12 people, including myself, fully remote. I've now just met my third person from the team after four years um, because I'm living in Europe now and two of them are based in Europe. And uh, so we've tried this VR stuff because we don't really know how else to do team building, um, which is one of the reasons why I was asking you if you thought about that. But I guess I'm curious to know what made you want to start this company, actually. Previous career was as an, a lawyer, uh, a lawyer, and I did some other kind of corporate stuff before that. And when I moved into the startup world, I was doing marketing, it was remote and I was working alone. I started to recognize and appreciate just how much the social component uh, of work plays into your life and your happiness and your you know, wellness. And so uh, seeing that for me, seeing it, how it can expand to other people, became very clear very quickly, uh, especially with the virtual ones because of the time we were in. It's like pandemic hit, pretty much everyone in the world was stressed, right? Like everything around us was stressor, stressor, stressor. And some, some of the early uh, testimonials or feedbacks, comments that we got from guests were like, wow, thank you so much for 90 minutes. I forgot everything that's going on in the world right now. So we realized that it's like, it's more than just connecting people. It's like letting people feel good. Uh, during the workday and beyond. So when exactly did you start this business? Team building itself started really the day the pandemic did, March 9th or whatever it is when everything went down. Uh, prior to that, uh, we did have companies that sit underneath it. So we were operating independently as uh, thegreatguacoff.com, um, which is the guacamole making competitions at offices. We had Museum Hack. We had one called Gingerbread Wars, which is uh, we bring kits, uh, gingerbread kits to people's offices during the holidays and you make themed uh, houses like zombie apocalypse themed or something uh, fun. Uh, and so each of those independent brands we had were operating for anywhere between the low end kind of six months uh, and at the higher end a couple of years before the pandemic started. Uh, we knew that we wanted an umbrella brand for them. We were able to acquire teambuilding.com uh, but had 
set up a site, weren't actively using it yet. We were looking for the right reason because it's a massive amount of work to shift your company, your, your team, your marketing, everything towards uh, a new brand, especially one that looks very different than what we were doing previously. So uh, pandemic hit, the in-person businesses that we had crashed immediately, right? Like all of the leads stopped. The clients that had booked events were canceling and asking for refunds. It was a very, very bad uh, position for a business to be in. Uh, we knew that we had to switch to something. It seemed like the right opportunity to do uh, virtual team building and to do it under uh, teambuilding.com. So uh, March 2019 started to uh, exist. Within 24 hours, we had our first customer. Um, even with the uh, kind of harsh hit to the previous businesses, we still finished out that month uh, profitably and then grew rapidly from there. Um, the in-person businesses were in a handful of major US cities, so New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, like think of one that might have a bunch of large corporations and that was the right place for us to be to run events. But with team building, all of a sudden we were reaching people, not just all across America, but all over the world. So clients in the UK, Canada, Australia, Singapore, uh, on and on and on. So you were saying off air that team building has about eight or 90 people. Is that between uh, those um, other companies that are under the umbrella as well or? Uh, so it all operates as one company now. So yeah, the, the employees are our collective group. And I believe right now the number is 90. Uh, we have uh, full-time staff who are the sales team, marketing, uh, customer service, et cetera. And then we have uh, all of our event hosts. Uh, almost all of them are part-time. There's a few that are full-time, um, but all as employees. Uh, and we're somewhat seasonal as business. So for example, quarter four is quite busy for us. Uh, as companies are not just doing team building, but they're also doing holiday parties. And so we'll bring on seasonal staff, which pushes us up to more like, uh, I think it was 180 last year or almost 200 even, uh, with more hosts, more, more support staff, et cetera. Was this always a remote thing for you? Cause I know you, you travel a lot, so I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think it was a pretty intentional choice for me. So. I had, I guess, like a lot of people who eventually become uh, nomadic had started traveling early, right? Like right out of high school, it was let's go. I visited uh, friends for about the Japan and like hopped over to Korea uh, the next summer, backpacked uh, through a bunch of European countries solo. And then with work, had initially gone the direction of, hey, I just finished my undergrad. I'm not sure entirely what I want to do. I went to law school. I became a lawyer, uh, and frankly, it wasn't a very happy one. Um, I think it's uh, I think it's a great and important profession, but didn't didn't fit for me. And one of the things was that I found it very restrictive. It's very difficult to be um, a nomadic lawyer because your clients want and often need to see you in person, right? Like you have to be there to sign documents, to witness documents, to have like frankly very important conversations. Uh, and so I put myself through school doing freelance marketing stuff, returned to that and uh, have been remote ever since. So marketing lends itself much more readily to remote work, nomadic, really be anywhere. Nobody cares where you are as long as you're getting results, right? Uh, so that was in 2012 or 2013, I think. Um, so I'm going on, going on 10 years. During that time have oscillated between um, traveling more, traveling less. Some of it I would go and stay in say New York for six months, or I'd go to uh, China is somewhere I've spent a lot of time. There were about two years off and on. And the two years before the pandemic uh, were the busiest with really come country hopping every one to three months, uh, Australia, Thailand, Bali, um, when the pandemic hit, I was in the Canary Islands with my partner and we already planned to stay three months, right? The European, uh, zone, let's say stay with, as a Canadian, I could stay for, uh, three months before they'll boot you out. Pandemic hit, lockdown, no flights out of the Canaries meant that we ended up staying for seven months instead. Um, and then from there, uh, have become less nomadic. We need, it's very, very difficult. Anybody listening to try it, incredibly difficult to be nomadic during a pandemic, right? The number of quarantines and restrictions, um, and different places that you can or cannot go. So 
uh, we've been we've been a lot more stable since. Uh, I do want to get back to travel, but might be might be towards the tail end of my life as a nomad. It's interesting because we were at different parts uh, in the way we were thinking as you were relaying your story where like during the pandemic, the first 18 months or so, I was in Vietnam. That's it. I was in Vietnam. I, I didn't leave for a year and a half, almost two years. And I went back to America in June of 2021 and I stayed in Miami for almost a year except for Atlanta for a week. Cause like I hadn't seen some family in five or six years and like, I, I had no choice. Um, and then in May of 2022, I had my visa for Portugal and I said, I'm free. I'm, I am going to travel. I don't care if I get COVID in Europe, I am going to travel because it's been basically two and a half, three years since I traveled. Like the last time I traveled before I left Vietnam was I was in uh, Europe in 2019, actually November 2019, for uh, a blockchain conference in Malta. And then I ended up going to Switzerland to meet an investor. And then I was in Paris for a week visiting a friend. And then I flew back to Vietnam. So from November 2019 to June 2021, I was like in one place and I was like desperate to move. And... And so when I got to Europe in May of this year, I was like, okay, I'll be in Greece for three weeks. I'll be in Slovenia for two weeks. I'll be in Spain for a few weeks. And then I'll be in Portugal and I'll be in this part of Portugal. Then I'll be in this part of Portugal. And after traveling for three months, basically straight, I'm like looking for an apartment and I just want to settle down because it's been really difficult actually having a podcast where I want to record but sometimes I have a place to record. Like right now for this week, I'm lucky I've got a really quiet place that I can record. But there was like a month in Spain where I couldn't record anywhere unless I wanted to pay 30 euros an hour for a meeting room in a co-working space because the place I was staying just could, didn't support it. Like there was just no way to do it. So like I'm trying to work on myself and my business and like I can't do that if I'm moving around so much. So I, I'm like also kind of going back. It seems like, like you where I'm kind of like looking for stability again. Yeah. yeah. I think it helps a lot. I can relate to the podcast thing. Years ago, I had one about, uh, it was about writing. So like, how do you become a successful writer online or books or whatever? Uh, I remember I set up uh, an interview with Steve Cam from nerd fitness. Uh, and I was in Beijing at the time I was renting an apartment. I woke up at like 5 AM or whatever in the morning to do the call. So it'd be a reasonable time for, uh, Steve and woke up to film that all the power was off and there was no way, there was no way for me to record anything, right? It was one of those, I live abroad and I can't fix it situations. So actually, um, never ended, never ended up, I mean, chatted with Steve since, uh, we connected in New York, we're friends there, but, uh, never got to do, uh, the interview many years ago. What year was this that you were in Beijing? Uh, I first visited in 2008, so uh, Olympics year, big year for China, and then uh, it was two years off and on between then and now, although by now means before pandemic, of course. So I arrived in Wuhan in July 1st, 2008. So I was there right before the, uh, the Olympics, and I was a teacher at the time, I was 21. And I wasn't able to go to the Olympics, but for some reason, my students were like, oh, are you going to go to the Olympics? I'm like, how can I go to the Olympics? I'm here teaching you guys. <laughs> yeah, sure. But what was also really funny was I was taking pictures of like, uh, no, I was sharing pictures. I brought, I brought pictures from Miami to show my students. So they were all like college students. And the sky was so blue, you know, because America. And they're like, nah, these pictures are fake. They can't possibly be real. The sky, like, it's it's too, like, no, you look outside. The sky is gray. Like, that's what the sky looks like. It's like, no, guys, no. So 2012 or 13, I uh, spent quite a bit of time there, and it was the worst years in recorded history, right? It wasn't just look at the sky. It was like, oh, you can't see the building across the street. It was very, very, very bad uh, and sad for the people that live uh, in the environment. So what was it that drew you to being in China for so long. Most people can't handle it for more than like a few weeks, let alone a few years. All right, I love it. I can't wait to go back. So uh, 2008, I finished up college. Um, in my final year, I had to 
done two classes in Mandarin. And the professor was like, hey, does anybody want to go to China for a month of the summer to continue um, learning and improving? So I went as part of that trip uh, to Nanjing with 20 or so classmates. And then when that was done, a friend and I stayed uh, for the rest of the summer. We taught English for a bit. We backpacked around, uh, had a good time. Uh, I found it incredibly empowering to kind of live and work uh, and just be there speaking another language. Uh, it's like fun. It's very challenging. Uh, it feels a little bit like playing life on hard mode, which still is interesting to me now. It's particularly interesting to me at the time. Just, yeah, needing to figure out. It's like, oh, you want to buy a train ticket? You better figure out how. Um, or food, right? Like we showed up in China, even after eight months of studying in school, realized that the only words I knew were like banana and rice. And you obviously want to eat much more than that. So yeah, learning how to navigate food. Uh, and from there, made good friends and kept going back uh, and got involved in business there, which was fun. I learned German through middle school and, or sorry, high school. And I took a class in uh, college before I went and did a study abroad in uh, study abroad in Salzburg, Austria in 2005. So that was my first time being abroad. I was 18. And I realized in the two months that I was there that like the four years I spent learning German was absolutely useless because my host family didn't speak a word of English. And I, and being in Austria, they, they didn't speak uh, high German the way I learned in school. They spoke Bavarian, which is slightly different. So what I decided to do was I, I knew about a few months before I left for China that I was going and I decided to learn zero. I said, I'm going to just learn on the streets with the people. Because, of course, we didn't have smartphones yet, so you could do that still. So that's what I did. And I actually met a few people who were from Canada, and they had studied for two years in school to, to go to China then and, and, you know, use their Mandarin. And they arrived two months after I did. My Mandarin was better than theirs, and they never caught up to me, even though they stayed there for years after. And uh, it just occurred to me, I think you, saw, you said Wuhan uh, in July 2008. I think I was there in August 2008, so very likely that we were there uh, at the same time. It's very possible. It was a huge city. People don't realize. What was interesting for me as an American, especially growing up in Miami and then studying in uh, University of Florida in Gainesville, Gainesville has like 100,000 people in it. So imagine I, I had spent four years living in Gainesville and then I flew basically from Miami after like a month or two of being there to China, which like I thought Wuhan was going to be this like nothing little village. And here I am to find there's like 12 million people living there and I'm like, what the hell is this? You know, it, uh, it was very, very different and very interesting. Um, and I was basically lied to by my agent. They were like, yeah, this is an up and coming city. Everyone wants to move here. It's like really difficult to get a job here. And like, just you're lucky I've got a job for you. And I'm like, okay, sign me up. <laughs> and looking back, I think part of me is like, oh, I wish I never lived in Wuhan. But the other part of me is like, if I had never lived in Wuhan, I may not have ever learned Chinese. So now that I have this experience, I have a specific kind of not really a formula, but I, I have specific things I look for when I decide where I'm going to go next. Do you have something like that? Uh, no, we were actually pretty unintentional about it. So before the pandemic, we would... So the path that I mentioned before, it's like what brought us to Australia was work. Um, we were there for a museum conference as part of the museum hack business. Uh, my partner gave a keynote and I did a marketing workshop. Uh, it was the first time I've been to Australia because Australia is really far. Uh, from Canada and the U.S. So I uh, got there, spent a little bit of time, and then realized that it was a great opportunity to visit uh, other places that previously seemed too far. So for example, it takes forever to get to Bali, right? From almost everywhere. If you leave from Toronto, New York, Los Angeles, even when I was living in Beijing, it was like another 10 hours or something to get to Bali. So it just didn't uh, go, um, which sounds silly now because I've taken a lot of flights that are way longer than that. But uh, Australia to Bali is like four hours. And so it was such a no brainer to go there next. Uh, and then from Bali to Thailand and then from Thailand actually went back to China. Um, there's direct flights to Chengdu and then um, there's a great, uh, the, the rapid train that goes across the country. So start in Chengdu, stop in Changsha and then Beijing at the end. I have to say having 
been in China before the high speed rail was finished. And then having experienced the high speed rail many times over the years after it was finished, and then leaving China and experiencing transportation everywhere else in the world, I'm like depressed that the rest of the world sucks. A little bit, yeah. The transportation system is incredible. Although、uh, I imagine you've taken some of the overnight trades. There's still a charm to doing it, right? So I did a, a group trip. I brought some friends to China, and we traveled around for two weeks. We could have taken the rapid train from Beijing. I think that one was Beijing to Chengdu,、um, but instead took the overnight train because there's like there's something about the charm and like talking to people and having meals on the train and all that. And then we took the rapid one back because you only have so much time in two weeks. In 2008, I had friends come to visit. That was the only time I had friends come to visit. Sorry, 2009, summer of 2009. So in in ten years in China, only one group of friends came to visit. So I'll preface that.、Uh, They arrived in Wuhan, and we stayed there for like a week or so. And I had a, a girlfriend, a girlfriend from Wuhan at the time, and she traveled with us. We took, obviously, this high speed trains didn't exist yet, so we took a train, I think, to Guilin, which, for people who don't know, Guilin is a very beautiful mountainous town. It's probably destroyed by tourism now. It wasn't that bad in two thousand nine. Um, it was like probably eight or nine hours away. It wasn't a terribly great train experience. And then from there, we took a train to Chengdu. And the person who I bought the train ticket from at the station made me believe that it was only like eight hours from Guilin to Chengdu, but no, it was twenty five. And I thought my Chinese was good enough to express all of this and communicate this. My girlfriend was with me, but I guess she wasn't like with me at the ticket buying station because I was like, "Oh, I got this, I got this." But it wasn't until seven and a half hours into the train ride that I was like, "Okay, yes, we're like we're gonna be there in an hour." And someone who could speak English overheard me, and he was like, "Actually, no, it's we're not even close. Like, there's another fifteen hours or so." It's like, "Well, what are you talking about?"、And、they're like, "Well." You know, this is the reality, and they explained. And then I went to the, I guess the conductor or one of the people working on the train, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we'll be there at like eight in the morning." I was like, "No." And the reason I was upset is because we didn't get the sleeper car. We we got the chicken car. You know, have you been on a chicken car?、Uh, I've never called them that, but I know exactly what you mean. So,、yes. so for for people who don't know. That's the train car that doesn't have air conditioning. There's fans. The fans are mostly broken. There's also chickens running around inside, and you've got these open little windows, and you've got these hard seats. And there's six people in one little. You know, there's three people with a little table facing three more、uh, people, and that's the train car. There's like a bunch of these tables and chickens and, and all that. And. I thought, yeah, we can handle this for eight hours. But after eight hours, realizing that it was going to be another fifteen or so, I can't. I, I don't remember how I responded, but I can tell you, it wasn't anything positive. It was we suffered for a long time for that.、Um, but Chengdu was gorgeous, and the People's、uh, Park was gorgeous, and the there was this restaurant there inside of the park, and they had kung pao chicken. It was the best kung pao chicken I've had in my life. I don't know if you've ever been to the People's、uh, People's Park.、Um, yeah, China is and has been this incredible life changing experience for me. I wish more people could could experience it.、Uh, as you said, it's one of those places you you look forward to going back to. I lived there for ten years. I spent my twenties in China. Like for me, China is my home. You know, and and having to leave China was really sad. It's still sad. I miss China a lot, but I don't want to go back. So that's one of the reasons why I'm in Europe now. So,、um, so yeah, you've been traveling for ten or eleven years. How many countries have you been to? And besides China, what's your favorite one so far, and why?、Uh, I don't know the exact number, and I guess never measured it that way.、Um, 
<laughs> and frankly, part of it was like, I traveled a lot before China, right? So I'd go, I, hey, I'm in Europe. I want to visit as many countries as I can in Europe, even if it's just like a stopover in uh, Luxembourg or something before you go on to Belgium, because, hey, at least I could say I visited Luxembourg. Um, so um, most of, I guess most of Europe, a handful of places in Asia, but once I went to China, I just kept going back to China, all other travel other than, I guess, a couple of things that came up with work, uh, just stopped. Beyond China, uh, there's a couple of places that uh, I think of family in my heart. Korea is wonderful, geographically, of course, very close to China. Um, there's something special in Korea with, <laughs> it's actually, it's gonna sound very cliche. It's like the people, the people make it so great. You can say that about almost everywhere you go, but my experience, the people that I specifically met in Korea were all wonderful. Uh, and the food is so good. Uh, arguably, uh, I don't know if I'd put it above or below Chinese cuisine, but they're my two favorites. Um, and then the Canaries were surprisingly nice too. So Canary Islands, where we were before the pandemic, um, relatively small island. I think you can drive around the whole thing in like three hours. We made some stops along the way, but um, small, small cities. Was very happy to be there for seven months and the pandemic, if there's any silver lining to it, at least for us and being stuck there was that there were no tourists, which meant that we could enjoy things like the beautiful boardwalk and the oceanfront and these places that are often bustling with people just in quiet and by ourselves. So it's quite, quite serene, quite nice. Yeah. How do you handle work as you travel? Uh, sometimes very well, sometimes less so. Uh, a downside of the Canaries was that for that seven months, we were basically on dial up internet from the nineties, right? It was so difficult, especially with the previous company going to zero and needing to rebuild. It was, you know, sometimes we could barely do Zoom calls, et cetera. Um, other, other locations can be much better in, in a location now that has fiber internet, even though we're on a remote island. It's like, I don't know how that exists, but uh, it does extremely well and better than kind of the town I grew up in, or frankly, even better than New York City uh, and parts of it. There's... Uh, there is a balance of trying to work and enjoy the places you're in as well, uh, which I would confess I'm not good at. I think we lean a little bit too much towards work. So, you know, spending three weeks in the Greek islands is potentially incredible, except barely left the hotel room, mostly just left to go to the grocery store to, uh, to get goods to come back and keep going. So... Not, not enough balance in the past. I think an exception to that is when we intentionally visit places that uh, we have friends at and then spend more time with them. So, right, have a good friend in Bali and would spend a lot more time together. In China, going to visit friends would be uh, a really nice break from work. The most, uh, the most challenging place uh, that I've ever tried to work from is cruise ships. So. Uh, you can do the three, four, five, six days ones around the Caribbean, and that's fine. And, uh, you know, internet, I don't know, it might be like $20 a day, which is expensive internet, but it generally works. You can do your thing. Uh, I recently did a transatlantic cruise uh, with a good buddy. Um, actually, there were, there were five of us total, so a group, group of people. Uh, and uh, it started in Miami, it ended in Amsterdam, with barely any stops along the way, mostly ocean days. Uh, and once you hit the middle of the ocean, it doesn't matter how much you pay for internet, it's, it's so painfully slow and similar where um, had work that we really needed to be doing and you're in that rough spot, kind of like you on, on your chicken trade ride, right? It's like, oh God, we're only eight days into this, there's another eight days to go before we could we could uh we could do something normal so and we worked we worked through it and have um it should give credit to we have a fantastic team um of smart hardworking people who are very capable and competent aside from us and so the business continues to run uh it's more just oh the projects that we personally really wanted to work on and invest our time in that got delayed or or shorted to be fair, when I was on the train, I was a teacher. So when I traveled, I had no work with me. When I was younger, I would be like, oh, I'm going to go to Thailand for a month. And I had zero work to do when I was in Thailand that month. And I could enjoy the hell out of my time. So part of me does 
think fondly back on those times when I could travel for weeks or months at a time and didn't have to work. But then at the same time, I wouldn't be making money. So of course I'd have to go back to work to make more money to be able to travel again. So I think there's, there's a benefit in having a job that you can do no matter where you are. So you can always make money and spend it wherever you want. When I was in Greece in May, I had a friend there who I actually met in Shenzhen. He's from Athens and we're close there for, you know, a few years before I left and, and all that. And I hadn't seen him in like four or five years. So I was like, I have to get to Greece. It's got to be my first stop in Europe. I missed this guy. We're like, we were really close in China. And it was really cool because I basically stepped into his life. I got to see his friends. I got to see the places he likes to go. I got to meet his mom and his dog. And I got to stay at their house for a few days. Otherwise, I was at Airbnbs. Um, but there was a part of Athens where, um, like, he, his for his birthday, we ended up going to one of his friend's weddings, which was amazing, seeing a big, fat Greek wedding, um, being invited to that. Like, it's not something that you would normally experience as a tourist. But, but like you said, I... I have spent the last 15 years building a network of friends. And as I go to new countries, I make friends with people when I'm there and I keep in touch with them. And sometimes they stay there and I'll go back and visit them. And sometimes they'll move to somewhere else and I'll go visit them there. So for example, um, another friend of mine is from Belgrade. And when I was an HR manager in Shenzhen, I hired him to come over to China and work. And that was nine years ago. But we ended up living together. We became friends. We both left that company after some time. We remained friends for a few years before I left and he left. And then a few years later, he was living in Barcelona and I was in Israel and I was like, hey, I'm going to go over to Barcelona and see you for a week or two. And he's like, yeah, come on over. So I went there and I stayed with him and his wife. And funny enough, his wife, she's from Slovenia. They met in China. So I, I kind of enabled him to find his wife. Um, and now they're living in Ljubljana. So after Athens, I went to Ljubljana because I hadn't seen them since Barcelona in 2018. And now they got a little boy and they, they're also friends with the Greek guy because they all met in China as well. So that was like really cool to be able to spend that time with them. And from there, when I went to Valencia for a month, I was, uh, I actually lived with a guy I met on a digital nomads channel on Telegram five years ago. And it just so happened that another guy in the channel is also from Valencia. And then there's a Swedish guy also living in Valencia from that channel. So I got to spend the month with them. And like, that was just, it's just so cool to be able to travel and like meet people you've known online for years or to, you know, see people again, you've been on, uh, you've been friends with. So it's, it's really, really cool to be able to just like walk into their lifestyle and, and just like see what they love about the places they're in. Okay. Well, now I'm curious. I found that having, uh, having a network of friends all around the world is incredible for, for very similar reasons. Uh, but that it's also meant that I don't have as high a concentration of friends in any one place. Have you had the same thing? Has that played into where you've settled, et cetera? So in, when I went to Vietnam, I only knew one person and that person is now an investor in my company. Um, but I met him in Shenzhen actually at like a private dinner party for like crypto bros. And uh, they were all Chinese. They didn't speak any English. They're all in their 20s. They're throwing $10,000, $20,000 dinner parties. And one person will just pay for the whole meal for, for all of the people there. It's like crazy stuff. Um, and he, he happened to be a guest. And I was a guest as well at this one party. And we, we met. We became friends. And now seven years later, he's invested in my company. But I, I ended up moving to Vietnam. One of the reasons was because of him. And um, I built friendships you know, that were there as well. But, um, but I'd actually been to Vietnam in 2011. Um, first. So I kind of had an idea of what it was like. But uh, coming to Portugal again, like I, I didn't know anybody. So I, I tend to normally just pick where I want to go based on where I think has the best potential for myself. And I tend to travel short term to places where I know people so that I know that I'm going to have like a fun time. Because like, I, I know how like I have a strategy for how to very quickly become a local in any place. But if I know someone that's already there, it makes it better because I, I do my own research, but then also they're like, oh, hey, by the way, let's go meet this person or let's go to this restaurant. I, I've known the owner since I was five, or, you know, like these kinds of things that uh, add a lot of context 
and love to the experience that you would normally never experience just as a, a person going by yourself. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Plus, it's nice if the friend invites you to the wedding. If you just show up on your own, it's a little bit weird. Yeah, well, so I was supposed to leave a few days before his birthday. I didn't even, like, for some reason, he never told me his birthday in all these years. And he's like, oh, by the way, like, my birthday is in two days. Can you, like, would you mind staying? And I was like, of course, man. Yeah, of course I'm going to stay for your birthday. Like, sure. So then we were supposed to do something for his birthday. And he's like, well, all those plans fell apart. But my, my friend's having a wedding. So, like, I got you and let's go. Okay yeah so like just the randomness i think of uh these these kinds of lifestyles is cool so one of the things that i think about that i think a lot of people are shocked by which i think you're very similar to me in is minimalism so i have a backpack and i have a 25 inch rolling luggage recently I, I i recently upgraded i had like a 10 year old backpack and a 10 year old duffel bag and i said i'm tired of carrying those things around so i'm gonna get something nicer um but at 36 that's my life everything i have fits in those things if it doesn't fit in it doesn't go what how do you move around is that something similar for you for the last 10 years it was so i after so after college I moved across the country for law school, got rid of all my stuff. When law school ended, I got rid of all my stuff again. And I was like, why even get more stuff? Because I'm probably going to get rid of it. So just started living out of a small uh, backpack and became much more sophisticated with it over time. Uh, so the pack, uh, the pack that I carry, the pack that I'm very comfortable to live out of is just a 20 liter um, bag. It's like a book bag, right? Laptop bag. Uh, the one that I use is the Manal Daily. Uh, and the items that go into it are very intentionally chosen. So for example, the pants, they're from Patagonia. They're more like windbreaker shell pants that fold up into basically nothing. They're like one twentieth of the size of even just one pair of jeans. Um, same for the jacket, same for the shirts. It's like two shirts, two pairs of underwear, one pants, one shorts, laptop, toiletries. Uh, it's a very, very, very short list of things uh, that I've lived with for a long time. Now that I've settled, there's a condo, there's a bed, there's furniture, right? Like it no longer all fits in just a backpack, but I was a purist for a long time. Uh, and even when I moved here, coming through customs uh, was very challenging because they said like, they, they pulled me aside as they would if they thought that, you know, something you're carrying was an issue or you're trying to, you know, bring in too much value stuff through customs or whatever. And they just looked at my bag and they went like, where's the rest of your stuff? Uh, and I said, this is, this is all I got. And they said, how could that be? And I went, I'm a minimalist, right? I'm this guy that's just, I don't know, very happy and content with that lifestyle, but it's very foreign to them, right? This wasn't communicating well. So they opened everything up. They went through every single little piece uh, with the framework. And what they said to me was like, we understand that you're a minimalist, but I would take more of this on a three-day vacation, right? Like if they went somewhere, they would have they they would have a bag and a side bag or a suitcase or whatever uh and so it got it got increasingly difficult as they would ask questions like well how long are you stay at that say i move in here permanently and on and on from there uh, i think their particular concern was that there was strict quarantines uh, at the time and so initially coming into the country it's like 14 days so if uh, if you're not of the mindset and if you've never tried to live out of a backpack before, it's like, oh, of course this guy is going to need more stuff. Like he's going to have to break quarantine. He's going to have to go and get things when, uh, as you know, the reality is actually you can live out of that small bag pretty much indefinitely uh, if, if you have kind of the right items with you. I have to concede the crown to you because I have a lot more stuff than that. Like I, I think I have two weeks worth of socks and underwear and shirts, but like two pairs of shorts and two pairs of pants. And like, it's like, I guess because if I know I'm going to be somewhere for two weeks, I know that I can arrive with everything clean. And when I leave, I'll do the laundry. And where I, when I get to the next place, it's clean again. So I just don't want to clean stuff every day or two. Yeah. Yeah. That's fair. I think, um, uh, part of it would be my lifestyle. I tend to just stay home and work. And so if you're not going outside and getting sweaty, dirty, whatever, right? Like you can just wear uh, a shirt, especially one. They're all like wool shirts or natural fibers or whatever. They tend to not get as stinky as fast. So you could wear it for a week and then rinse it in the sink and you're pretty much good again. Uh, and then the shorts and pants and stuff are no problem. So 
Yeah, I think different preferences and optimizing towards them. Uh, my friend Tynan, so Tynan.com is uh, a lot more uh, probably sophisticated and thoughtful about how he does it. Like he wants a wardrobe that is a little bit more diverse. So it's a button up shirt that you could wear um, casually hanging out with friends or to a formal dinner or to, to literally anything versus if I'm going to a formal dinner, I'm showing up in a t-shirt because that's what I have. That's what I brought. That's what I'm comfortable in. You moved there seven months ago, you said? Uh, I think a year and a half. A so. year and a half. And when did you buy the condo? And was that a difficult decision for you because yeah. of the minimalism? Yeah. So I rented a, rented a place for about a year first or 10 months or whatever the, the term was. And probably would have been very happy to just continue renting, uh, especially places here tend to come furnished. I found the same thing in China, right? It's like, if you rented an apartment, there's already a bed there, there's a desk uh, and stuff, which was uh, nice. But buying, uh, I guess, had a couple of things going for it. One is, it did seem like the ultimate investment in stability. There is something about when you're renting where it's still, still the landlord's spot, right? And if they want to come in and do stuff or if, um, whatever. And also being at a place where I was ready to get more things that I wanted and liked. So when I traveled in the past, for example, if I'd go in, if I'd go and stay in New York City for, for six months, I would buy a Tempur-Pedic bed or a higher quality one because to me, having high quality sleep for that six months uh, was more, was very, very important. And if I rented a place, they would have like super crappy spring bread, I wouldn't sleep well, that would be six uncomfortable months. Uh, and so buying a place where I knew that I was going to live for a long time meant like, oh, it makes more sense to buy the very comfortable bed that I want to get the, like to get a good desk chair, to get whatever it happens to be. So uh, investment in kind of long-term comfort. I think is, is one way to put it. I can definitely appreciate that. When I was in Vietnam and I had a, a two bedroom apartment, I specifically asked the landlord to take all of the furniture out of the second room. Cause it's like, I don't need another bed. Yeah, exactly. And so I put a desk and a chair in there. It was like a hundred dollars for the, for the desk and like $50 for the chair. But I worked from there and that was my quiet space. And I told, I told my ex-wife like, this is my space. I need to work here. So if the door is closed, leave me alone. And, and it worked quite well until, you know, she decided to ignore the door, but that's besides the point. Um, and I also had a bike because I, well, actually, so I got these things in her hometown. We were living there for, we were living in Nat Trang. I don't know if you've been, uh, if you know much about Vietnam, but so it's like this beautiful little, uh, like seaside town with like half, uh, with like maybe 250,000 people. And we were renting a four story house. It was like $500 a month. And the, the house was like this ridiculous thing. And it, it had no like real separation between the floors. So it was extremely hot all the time. Unless, so I had to like be in my room. So the only place I could work was in my room. So I just, I had to get a, a desk and a chair for it. And I got a bicycle and all that because, you know, it's seaside and who doesn't want to ride bike next to the ocean. And when I moved back to the city, I took that with me. It was a bitch to bring it back and it was expensive, but like it was worth it. And I ended up selling it when I left Vietnam. So I understand that for sure. Um, but I hate making those purchases because I know I have to get rid of them. And so it's annoying to buy them because you have to look for them and then you have to wait for them to come. And then you have to hope you like them and then you have to get rid of them when you're done. So it's like easier for me to just like tell the landlord, Hey, can you just provide this stuff? Yeah, fair. And sometimes to say yes. So like, for example, I'm looking for an apartment right now in Lisbon and the owner is French uh, of this place that I found. She owns a bit, she owns the building. She's furnished everything herself, de decorated everything herself. In the one that I want, it doesn't really have like a work desk. There's like a, a kitchen table, like a table you can work at, uh, you can eat at. And like, normally I would say I'd find a work there, but like on the floor in the apartment upstairs, there's like a desk, like a working desk with a chair. And I'm like, can you move that into my apartment? <laughs> like, that would be great. So I'm like hoping she says yes, because otherwise I have to like find something for myself, unfortunately. But, but yeah, sometimes uh, landlords can be on your side and other times they're not on your side. But I, 
one of the problems I found in Lisbon is that a lot of the places didn't want to furnish and they don't have air conditioning. And so I'm like, it has to be fully furnished. It has to be a modern style and it has to have air con. And they're like, sure, 1500 euros a month, please. It's like, guys, come on, but, but fine, whatever. So I want to talk a little bit more uh, about your business as we come to a close here. So you have a team of between 80 and 200, depending on the year. At this stage in your business, what are you focused on the most? Yeah, so a few things. We have within the company, there's uh, myself and uh, COO, Tasia, who basically co-CEOs, right? We run the company together, make all high-level decisions together, a lot of smaller decisions too. Uh, and then we have a management team uh, where there's individuals for uh, the head of each department and then the folks that come under them. The management team uh, is the one that we want to continue to develop the most. So with the number of people we have, with the amount of client work we do, um, with the complexity of operations now, you just need more managers uh, and more specific ones. So for example, um, one of the current managers has is essentially in charge of multiple departments. So removing her from that so she can focus on one specialty and then bringing in somebody who would take on, for example, uh, the client success or client support management role or whatever you would call it. Um, bringing on a sales director, bringing on um, uh, a management director who would kind of lead all operations to reduce the number of points of contact that we have. Um, <laughs> yeah, right, just like hiring, uh, hiring well and systematizing. Uh, beyond that, and what that enables is more growth. So with our business, yeah, virtual was very big throughout the pandemic. It continues to be pretty significant, all the remote teams or teams that are still kind of working between cities and so on. Um, but we've also reintroduced in-person events in the last three months. And that has uh, allowed us to continue growth. It is also in some ways doubled the complexity of the business. Like we're running two businesses. One is a virtual business, one is in-person events. And so um, pursuing those in a way that will be successful for the long term. How do you discover that someone new needs to be hired? Like I, basically, how do you discover that, that bottleneck, that point at which th something is not working and the only solution is to put someone in charge of it? Yeah, yeah, good question. I think there's a number of ways. The most direct and easy to identify is what am I currently doing that's not the highest value thing that I could be contributing to, right? So for example, uh, in the past, I did a lot of our uh, content marketing stuff. At first, I was literally writing the articles and then we hired a writer and I was editing the articles and then she grew to be an editor um, as I kind of went up and up the chain. So I'm still connected to our content and our marketing process, but she uh, leads a lot of it. And if you can really, as the, as the head of the company, literally everything you do should be up for delegation and if there's not a current team member that can take it on it does usually mean hiring uh, or outsourcing or automation or uh, one of the alternatives uh, another way is just looking at other companies and what they do so um, our our sales process for example is pretty strong we have a team uh, right now of i think six sales reps as well as the um, the management structure for that department um, and the manager's excellent and all the systems run very well, but we look at another company and go, oh, sales director is a role. We should explore that. Like, what would it mean in our organization? What would it enable and allow? So um, those would be the, the strongest two. One, delegating off what you already do and two, look at what other companies do towards the same goals you have. If there's a position that you need to like so you need to let someone go for it. do you jump into that role and see how you can improve it while you're trying to hire someone to replace it or like how do you handle that vacuum so usually uh if there's already there's already a fair amount i shouldn't say all right 
now there's a fair amount of redundancy built into the business in that, for example, if there's if there's six or 10 or, or whatever sales reps, client advisors on a team, if one person leaves, the work volume slightly adjusts and everything continues to operate fine. Same with customer service, uh, in a way, same with uh, marketing or operations or eventos or whatever it is. Uh, that's not to say that, so the, the individual contribution of everybody is incredibly important and I don't want to, um, I wouldn't suggest otherwise, but the, the team will always uh, adjust and carry it on. If there is a larger vacuum and you need to identify what to hire for, I think that, I don't know that it's, we, I don't know that we jump in directly in those cases. So Tash and I and the management team are involved um, very directly in a lot of, of the ground level work. And so, or maybe already in tune with it and know, know what we need and know what we need to hire for, um, which is helpful perspective. I think if you don't know what your people do and how they do it and the challenges that they go through in the day to achieve the results that you want them to, then you'd be very disconnected from the business in a way that it's not going to allow you to run it successfully and that employees are going to recognize, right? I think that if you are willing to, willing and like are actively involved with all aspects of the business, people can see that and appreciate it and know more that their work matters and is important. That's a little bit of a tangent, but I think a good one. How often do you do team building? And how often are you directly attending those team building exercises with your team? Yeah, so team building for clients, literally every day, right? Um, many, many events uh, every day, every week, every month. Internally, uh, we do a handful of different things. And I think team building can be, we could say team building events, or you could like team building activities, team building games, team building meetups, whatever it is, um, can be more expensive. But um, we do almost all of our own events internally, both as a way to connect people as well as a way to demo them um, so that everybody knows what's going on. We have in the virtual realm, 30 plus events. And so that's probably the 30 plus internal team building events that we've done. Uh, and then as part of that, and in some cases, in addition to it, uh, one of the best events that we found for our team is to do trivia that's aligned with identity month. So black history month, pride month, uh, uh, women's history month, where we'll have an hour of trivia set up. It's not just trivia questions, but puzzles and things that people solve together. Uh, and then it's a way to do team building together. It's also a way to like educate and promote diversity. Uh, at the end, we, uh, the winning team selects uh, a charity or nonprofit and the company makes a donation uh, on everybody's behalf to it. Uh, and it's very, very, very good. Aside from that, we do, I guess, I don't know if smaller is the right word, but we could call it smaller team building stuff for now. So we do team lunches. We do each department will get together. We do um, elements of team building in our monthly all hands meeting. Uh, so really, <laughs> I guess the short answer would be a lot. We do a lot of team building. Sometimes like we'll arrange team building and I'll show up for some amount of the time. Or sometimes I won't show up at all because I don't want, I want the team to like focus on each other. And, and not, I, so I, I'm trying to like balance that. Um, some of the things we've done in the past is we use old space VR. Um, only my CTO and I have headsets. So everyone else uses the browser based version. Um, but inside of there, we built our own world and we've got trivia in there and there's music and some like darts and basketball and stuff that they can just throw around, you know, with the keyboard and mouse and all that. Um, but we also have cards against humanity. <laughs> and so sometimes we'll play cards against humanity in VR, which is hilarious, but also sometimes I feel weird, like, especially because we have females in the team and they'll play and they like take it pretty well. In fact, like they're probably more like dirty than I am, or maybe I'm just holding myself back. I don't know. Like, have you ever played cards against humanity or would you say like, as a CEO, like, I don't think it's right to. I've played it with friends. I don't know that I play it with staff. So similar to you, uh, I, I attend some of the team building events and then I intentionally 
don't attend others. An example of that would be we have an upcoming uh, company retreat uh, in New York. We're flying everybody in and meeting there. And so there's some of the evening social activities where it's just let our team go and enjoy without the, I, I don't even know if pressure is the right word, but without, without us being there so they could just do their thing. So yeah, very, very relatable. I get it. I uh, also love the, the VR idea and the browser based. Um, it's cool. How can people follow up with you? Uh, MichaelAlexis.com uh, is a good spot. I'm pretty sure my email is still on there. Uh, if you have to play population one, that would be a good place to connect. We can squat up, uh, and yeah, not, not active on social media. So that would be a, a path down the wrong hole. Fair enough. Well, thank you, Michael. I appreciate your time and your energy and don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day and don't forget to do team building activities with your team. Because if you don't, then your team will probably hate you and your company will die.